Welcome. I'm so glad you decided to join us once again as we've come out here in the woods to complete our series on the birth of Jesus Christ. This has been a four-part series and today I brought my lovely wife Christina out here to conclude this series with us as she shares a first-person narrative. Now I'm not going to tell you who she is and what character she's playing. You'll have to guess. It'll probably be pretty easy to figure out. But uh, I'm really looking forward to it, and I know she is too. And I hope that you are blessed by today's message. As we get started, I'd like to invite you to bow your heads with me in a word of prayer. Kind and loving Father in heaven, thank you, Lord, for this opportunity that we have to come out here to open your word, to enjoy together not only this book of nature, but your revelation of yourself in the person of Jesus Christ. And as we study, as we learn, as we listen to this story today, I pray that we will draw closer to you. We ask this, Lord, in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, Christina, I'm really looking forward to this. And, you know, I've, I've covered the Christmas story over the past few weeks from three of the four Gospels, Matthew, Mark, and John. Well, actually, Matthew, John, and, and Mark. But we haven't had, heard anything from Luke, so you think we could hear a little bit from Luke today? Yes. Let's go out to the woods. Let's go. From the time I was a little girl, there was one thought in my mind, the Messiah. Our people were in bondage. We were taxed out of just about everything we owned. We were forced to be servants of a cruel dictator. But the worst part of it was that God just didn't seem to care. He was strangely silent. Sure, we had the scrolls of Moses and the prophets, and we poured over those. But when you are oppressed, sometimes you just want something fresh from God, like a modern day prophet, some kind of confirmation that God still loves you and hasn't forsaken you. But nothing, not just in the past 50 years or 100 years, nothing for the past 400 years. We were confused. In the past, it was easy to see where we failed, we had started worshiping idols. We intermarried with the heathen tribes around us. We, we killed prophets that God sent to us. We desecrated the temple. We neglected worship, ignored the writings of Moses, and even let our priests starve. Moses had warned us, but it shall come to pass. If you do not obey the voice of the Lord your God to observe carefully all his commandments, and his statutes, which I command you today, that all these curses will come upon you and overtake you. The Lord will send on you cursing, confusion, and rebuke in all that you set your hand to do until you are destroyed and until you perish quickly because of the wickedness of your doings in which you have forsaken me. We had deserved everything we got, but this time, what did we do wrong? We were studious. We kept ourselves distant from every nation around us. We educated all of our children in the ways of God. We kept the Sabbath faithfully. We paid our tithes and our offerings. We kept all the feasts. And yet, yet, this is the way God is rewarding us? Silence, oppression, poverty, sickness? Yes, this is the world I grew up in. This is why we longed for, dreamed of, hoped for, prayed for, sang of, and lived for the coming of the Messiah. You can see why it was so easy for us to have big dreams and plans for this Messiah of ours. We wanted freedom. We knew that God wanted us to be happy. We also knew these promises, that if we were faithful to God, he would make us prosper and send away our enemies. 
Take Moses, for example. Not only had he warned us, but he had given us some promises too. He said, Now it shall come to pass, if you diligently obey the voice of the Lord your God, to observe carefully all his commandments, which I command you today, that the Lord your God will set you on high above all the nations of the earth. The Lord will cause your enemies who rise against you to be defeated before your face. They shall come out against you one way and flee before you seven ways. We claim these promises because we knew we were being faithful. We kept the letter of the law. We deserved to be released from bondage. Surely, that's why the Messiah was coming, to save us from oppression. He was going to be a king. He was going to set up his throne and rule the world. Well, I mean, Isaiah told us a similar thing. Isaiah says, For unto us a child is born, unto us a son is given, and the government will be upon his shoulders, and his name shall be called Wonderful, Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. Of the increase of his government and peace, there will be no end. Upon the throne of David and over his kingdom, to order it and establish it with judgment and justice from that time forward, even forever, the zeal of the Lord of hosts will perform this. And then look at the prophet Micah. Micah also foretold this very thing. He said, Now it shall come to pass in the latter days that the mountain of the Lord's house shall be established on top of the mountains and shall be exalted above the hills and people shall flow to it. Many nations shall come and say, Come, let us go up to the mountain of the Lord to the house of the God of Jacob. He will teach us his ways, and we shall walk in his paths. For out of Zion, the law shall go forth, and the word of the Lord from Jerusalem. He shall judge between many peoples and rebuke strong nations afar off. They shall beat their swords into plowshares and their spears into pruning hooks. Nations shall not lift up sword against nation, Neither shall they learn war anymore. As I grew older, my friends and I also had dreams of our own. Dreams of growing up, getting married to good husbands, having lots of kids, all the stuff that the girls in my town thought about. But the dream, the biggest dream for every single one of us was that maybe, maybe my son would be the Messiah. Oh, to think of the honor that would be on me if my son was the Messiah. My family was in the line of David, so it could be very well possible. Or could it? No, it was only a dream. I'm from a poor family, in a poor little town known for some of the roughest people around. Certainly, God would choose a better family. Someone with fame, knowledge, and prestige. Someone who could influence all of Israel to rally their forces under the Messiah's banner. My parents always felt like it was important that all of their children became knowledgeable Jews, whether they were boys or girls. Now, only boys were allowed in the synagogue schools. So my brothers went there to learn to read the prophets and learn all the laws, which we had a lot of them. I was a girl, so I couldn't go to the synagogue. So I stayed home. However, my parents taught me at home. And as most girls do, I learned a fair bit from my brothers also. Soon I could read the prophets for myself, and that brought me so much joy. The years flew by as I grew up to be a dutiful young woman. I learned how to work hard. 
I had to get water from the well and carry it home each morning and evening. I kept the house clean and tidy. I swept the dirt floors faithfully every day. I learned to press olive oil with a stone, how to pound the grain into flour and knead it into flat bread. I cooked our family's meals over an open fire and occasionally made a trip to the village mill or the village brick oven when we had the money for a big batch of grain. I learned to serve my father and my brothers and any guests who came to visit. I even helped to organize parties, events, and weddings for our family and relatives. Even though women were always kind of in the background at such events, it was an honor to see an event go smoothly because of good organization. One day, my parents informed me that I was getting engaged. Oh, such excitement filled my heart at the news. The man was someone I looked up to and trusted in our community. He had a few gray hairs, just starting, but he had lost his wife and needed a homemaker. He was a hard worker and he ran his own business like most honest men in our community did. But he was also a God-fearing man and kind-hearted. Oh, I smiled as I thought about his kind face, his hardworking hands, his loving devotion to his late wife before she passed, and his skilled craftsmanship. In one year, I would be his wife. Oh, what joy filled my heart and put a spring in my step. Some people made me upset though. They whispered things about my fiance that I didn't like. I heard whisperings like, maybe God was punishing him by making him a widower. Maybe he had some secret sins in his life that no one knew about. Maybe that's why he worked so hard and never seemed to get ahead. I tried not to think about those things. Surely God was more just than that. Was God really out to just get us and punish us for every mistake? I started wandering near my fiance's workshop on my trips to and from the well, just to get a glimpse of his handsome face. Sometimes he'd see me through the window and I could see the twinkle in his eyes. Sometimes he was so busy he didn't notice me as I came by, but I really started looking forward to my trips to get water. One day, I was going about my work, sweeping the floor while my family was out, when suddenly a bright light filled the room. I was terrified. As my eyes adjusted to the brightness, I made out the form of an angel standing right in front of me. Rejoice, highly favored one, the angel said to me. The Lord is with you. Blessed are you among women. But when I saw him, I was confused. Why was an angel speaking to me? Why am I blessed? What have I done? Then the angel calmed my fears. Do not be afraid, Mary, for you have found favor with God. You probably figured out who I was already. <laughs> but yes, I am Mary. Behold, the angel said to me, you will conceive in your womb and bring forth a son and shall call his name Jesus. He will be great and he will be called the son of the highest and the Lord God will give him the throne of his father, David. And he will reign over the house of Jacob forever and of his kingdom, there will be no end. I was in shock. I'm not even married yet. I'm a faithful virgin waiting to have kids until after marriage. Consternation filled my heart. How can this be, I asked the angel, since I'm not with any man right now? And the angel answered, the Holy Spirit will come upon you and the power of the highest will overshadow you. The Holy One who is to be born will be called the Son of God. My mouth opened, but no sound came out. And so the angel continued. Now indeed, 
Elizabeth, your relative, has also conceived a son in her old age. And this is the sixth month for her that is called barren. For with God, nothing will be impossible. What? Like, my relative, Elizabeth, is pregnant in her old age? This gave me hope. Truly, this was a message from God. My heart filled with joy and submission as I answered the angel, I am God's servant. Let it be to me according to your word. And just as suddenly as he came, the angel disappeared. Can I even find words to describe the emotions that filled my heart as I was left alone in the now very dark house. My eyes slowly adjusted to the dim light of the oil lamp as my mind began to wrap itself around the words of the angel. First, it was an explosion of joy, like me, unknown, poor, young, Mary. I was chosen by God out of all the thousands of women to be the mother of the Messiah. My long awaited dreams were about to be realized. I just wanted to run and scream and shout for the whole town to hear. But I was a young woman and I was expected to behave. The second was a wave of fear. Would anyone believe me? Here I am, a young, single woman engaged to be married and now pregnant would i be stoned as a prostitute as our law demanded how am i supposed to explain this to my family or my friends and what about joseph if he married me he'd be accused of the one sneaking off with me and also condemned to die and if he didn't marry me i shuddered at that thought Yet there was one glimmer of hope, a passage that I remembered reading from the prophet Isaiah. It says, Behold, a virgin shall conceive and bear a son, and shall call his name Emmanuel, which means God with us. The prophets, the prophets have foretold this very thing. My experience is a fulfillment of scripture my parents, my family, and Joseph, his family, all of them are students of scripture. If they would only believe that an angel came to me, then it would be okay. Then the third wave of emotions hit harder than the first two. What if, what if this all wasn't real? It would be at least a couple months before I would even know if I was pregnant. Was it just a dream? Did an angel even come? What about Elizabeth? Elizabeth! Suddenly I knew exactly what I must do. I must go and pay a visit to Elizabeth immediately while I could still travel safely and no one was aware of what just happened. If she was six weeks pregnant, as the angel had said, then, then I would know for sure that this was really of God. This would be my sign. So I told my family goodbye, and I hurriedly set out for Judea. It was a long journey, over a hundred miles of walking. But I spent the lonely hours of travel thinking about my future. What was going to happen to me? Was this all real? I thought over the many promises of God, his watch care over his people, how many times he forgave us and gave us another chance. Would God save me from all this drama that I didn't ask for?
arrived at the house of Zacharias and greeted Elizabeth. I wasn't sure what to expect, but God heard my heart's longing cry and gave me just the assurance that I needed. When Elizabeth heard my greeting, the baby leaped in her womb and Elizabeth was filled with the Holy Spirit. She said to me, Blessed are you among women, and blessed is the fruit of your womb. But why is this granted to me that the mother of my Lord should come to me? For indeed, as soon as the voice of your greeting sounded in my ears, the babe leaped in my womb for joy. Blessed is she who believed, for there will be a fulfillment of those things which were told her from the Lord. I was stunned. I hadn't even said anything about the angel coming to me or that I wasn't sure if I might be pregnant or even more than just a hello. And here in the first few moments of greeting, God answered every single question on my mind. Yes, it is true. This really is happening. The angel was right. I am pregnant with the Messiah and Elizabeth is six months pregnant overcome with emotion my voice poured forth in praises to god as i sang my soul magnifies the lord and my spirit has rejoiced in god my savior for he has regarded the lowly state of his maidservant for behold henceforth all generations will call me blessed for who he who is mighty has done great things for me and holy is his name and his mercy is on those who fear him from generation to generation. Our songs of praise to God ended. We made our way into the house. I was shocked. There was Zacharias <laughs> motioning to me, but he couldn't speak. Elizabeth filled me in on her amazing story. The angel who came to her husband and that because of his unbelief, he had been struck dumb until the child should be born. His quietness every time I saw him was a constant rebuke to me for my doubts. The next three months flew by as we awaited the birth of Elizabeth's baby. If it turned out to be a healthy baby boy, then I would know for sure that this was the hand of God. And it was. Elizabeth gave birth to a beautiful, healthy baby boy. And even more shocking was the miracle that happened at the birth. Everyone was trying to name him when Zacharias motioned for a tablet and he wrote the words, his name is John. Instantly, his voice returned. He spent the rest of the day singing and praising God. As I headed the long miles back home, I was filled with awe and wonder. God was answering our prayers. John was to be the long looked for prophet that we had been waiting for 400 years and he is born. And now I know for a fact that I'm pregnant. I'm pregnant with a long looked for Messiah. More questions began filling my mind as I scarcely noticed the miles. What would it be like to raise the Messiah? What an awesome responsibility. I was determined to spend as much time in the scriptures as possible so that I could be the best mother to this little boy. But then familiar landmarks began bringing me back to reality. I was almost back to Nazareth. It was time to break the news. Every step became a prayer for wisdom and strength to meet the crisis ahead. As soon as I could, I began breaking the news. First, I told everything to my parents, the angel, the visit with Elizabeth and Zacharias, the birth of John, the prophecies foretelling the Messiah's birth. I told them everything. Then they took the news to Joseph. I prayed so hard, but Joseph was not convinced. He respected my parents, but he was sure that this whole thing was made up. 
that I had been unfaithful and now I was pregnant. He also felt sorry for me, and he didn't want to see me stoned if he made a public announcement. So he made up his mind to quietly break off our engagement and send me out of town so I wouldn't get caught. I pleaded with God to change Joseph's mind. I reminded God of all the miracles that he had worked already. I couldn't do this alone. I spent the entire night praying. The next morning, Joseph knocked at the door. He was in shock, but there was a faint smile on his face. He told my parents that he had had a dream last night, and an angel told him that this was indeed from God. I still remember his words that he said, the angel said, and she will bring forth a son and you shall call his name Jesus for he will save his people from their sins. Wow, he shall save his people from their sins. Those words were impressed in my mind forever. My parents immediately began planning a small wedding for Joseph and I. We kept it very small and low key, but we wanted to have it as soon as possible. It definitely wasn't like any of the weddings I had helped plan, but it was our wedding and it was still special. I moved into Joseph's home and began the adjustment of being a wife, stepmom, and pregnant all at the same time. It wasn't easy. And the townspeople didn't make it any easier. Now, I dreaded those trips to the well. The more I began to show, the more I saw the whispers, the evil looks, the rude gestures. Most of my friends stopped talking to me, and soon Joseph started having a hard time even finding work. Why? I asked Joseph, and even more I asked God. Why? Why would the mother of the Messiah be treated so cruelly? All my visions of honor and grandeur were crumbling. Humbly, I turned to God to be my strength. It was almost a relief when we got the word that Caesar Augustus was asking us to go to Bethlehem for the census. Maybe we could get away from all these cold faces and have a better life for the baby who would be soon making his appearance. I also smiled because I remembered Micah's prophecy. But you, Bethlehem, Ephrathah, though you are little among the thousands of Judah, yet out of you shall come forth to me the one to be ruler in Israel, whose goings forth are from of old, from everlasting. Yes, once again, God was taking care of us this really was the Messiah. It was a grueling journey for a woman nearly nine months pregnant. We journeyed south along the flatlands of the Jordan River. Then we headed west over the hills that surrounded Jerusalem. And finally, we arrived at Bethlehem almost a full week later. Towards the end of that trip, I wasn't even sure how much longer I could make it. Contractions were pretty consistent, and I knew it could happen any time. Just when I thought it was over, we reached the city gates and heaved a sigh of relief. <laughs> but alas, it wasn't any better. House after house after house turned us away. They were full. No one wanted two poor, dusty travelers who couldn't pay much. Not even the fact that I was in labor seemed to enlist their sympathies. Finally, someone with an ounce of pity, or maybe it was self-defense so I didn't have a baby on their doorstep, offered us their barn. It wasn't much, 
just a little shelter on the side of a hill. But we made the best that we could, bedding down in the dirty straw. And none too soon, because shortly afterwards, baby Jesus was born. Yes, it was a boy, just as the angel had said. The Messiah was born. I didn't have any cute baby clothes with me, but we tore some grave cloth into strips and swaddled him up securely. I chuckled to myself, God certainly has a sense of humor, sending the Messiah to be born in a cave and spending his first day wrapped in grave claws. It was hard to believe my own eyes, but yet we were at peace. God had taken care of us, and he was certainly leading. I laid back to rest, little knowing what the night had in store. A little later, Joseph noticed a bright light in the distant sky, but we were both too tired to think much of it. Suddenly, we were awakened again by the sounds of heavy footsteps. Shepherds! We were worried that we had commandeered one of their shelters and that they were upset with us. But no, it wasn't the case. As they reached the entrance, their voices hushed and they walked on tiptoe. Joseph greeted them and I could hear their excitement even in their whispers. Then he turned and led them inside. These shepherds just heard the angels announcing the birth of the Messiah and the angel sent them here to see us. His voice broke and he couldn't say anything else. The shepherds told us everything about the bright light, about the shining angel's message and the most beautiful angelic choir. I smiled as they repeated the angel's words. Do not be afraid for behold, I bring you good tidings of great joy which will be to all people. For there is born to you this day in the city of David, a savior who is Christ the Lord. And this will be a sign unto you. You will find the babe wrapped in swaddling cloths, lying in a manger. A savior, a savior, a savior. Those words kept ringing in my ears long after the shepherds left. It reminded me of the angel's words to Joseph. He shall save his people from their sins. This was a little different than my idea of saving Israel from the Romans. Was I misunderstanding the Messiah's mission? A week later, as we were at the temple in Jerusalem for the dedication of Jesus, we met two prophets, Simeon and a woman named Anna. Simeon's words as he blessed my child were never forgotten. First, he held Jesus to heaven as he prayed, Lord, now you are letting your servant depart in peace according to your word. For my eyes have seen your salvation which you have prepared before the face of all people, a light to bring light to the Gentiles and the glory of your people Israel. Then as he handed the baby back to me, he said, Behold, this child is destined for the fall and rising of many in Israel and for a sign which will be spoken against that the thoughts of many hearts may be revealed. Then he paused one more time and added, Yes, a sword will pierce through your own soul also. I wish I had more time to tell you so much more about the miracles that God worked on our behalf. The miracle of the star that led the wise men from the east to Bethlehem. The fact that they brought us enough gifts to live on for three years. The miracle of the angel that sent us scurrying to Egypt to escape being killed by King Herod's soldiers. How God led us back to Nazareth when we had decided we were never going back there again. 
I wish I had time to tell you of the years of raising Jesus at my knee, the joy of watching him grow up into manhood and teaching him to read the writings of Moses and the prophets, the wonder of seeing the light on his face when he went to Jerusalem for the first time at 12 years of age and pointed to his heavenly father, the support that he gave me during the years after Joseph died as he was a dutiful son supporting me. Oh, if only I could tell you of the pride in my heart when I heard about John the Baptist preaching and when my own son was baptized by John and God, God sent his token in the form of a voice and a dove. <laughs> and you have no idea the mother's pride when my son performed his first miracle at a wedding that I coordinated. Throughout the years of Jesus' life on this earth, I began little by little to understand the real truth of Jesus' mission. <laughs> I was thick-headed and slow to learn, I have to admit. There were a few times that I'm not proud of either, like times that I took sides with his brothers or even with the Pharisees a few times and tried to detract him from his mission all in the name of a mother's love. But he was so kind to me, he was so patient, and he was even willing to rebuke me when I needed it. But at last, when I saw my son bruised, stripped, and bleeding on that cruel cross, I finally began to understand what it all meant. When he was raised from the dead, when I saw his glowing face, and when he ascended back to heaven in the clouds with the holy angels, then I knew for sure, Jesus came to save. Not deliverance from the Romans, not to set up an earthly kingdom, not to give us temporal wants or desires. Jesus came to save us from the power of Satan. He came to save us from eternal death and separation from himself. He came, he lived, he died to save me, to save you to save everyone who is willing to believe on him. And the most amazing part of it all, he used me. He used me so that he could, through me, save the world. The words that Jesus spoke to Nicodemus at night in that lonely garden still rings true today. If you know it, you can say it with me. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever believes in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. For God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be saved. So why were my people in bondage when we were trying to do everything right? Because we forgot that we were sinners. We were trying to do it ourselves. We were trying to earn our salvation on our own. We tried to prove to God that we were right. And we got so focused on the letter of the law that we misunderstood God himself while Jesus was here. Friend, do you want to be saved? Do you need salvation? Don't try to do it on your own. You can't earn it. Don't wait any longer. Jesus is waiting for you with his arms open wide. He's there to forgive you. He's there to pick you up when you fall. He just says, my child, give me your heart. Trust me. Let's walk this journey together, hand in hand. And someday I'm coming to bring you home. If this is your desire, I just ask you to bow your head with me right now as we pray. Our precious Heavenly Father, we thank you. Thank you for the sacrifice that you made for us, that you loved us so much that you came to save us. It just, it fills our heart with awe and yet we're worth so little. We are such sinners. We have failed so many times. Father, I just ask that you will forgive us of our sins, that you will cleanse us and that you will make us your children. Father, we just thank you so much we claim your promises and we thank you for this marvelous Christmas gift that you've given to us in your son, Jesus Christ. And we thank you for that. 
We give you our hearts today. In Jesus' name.